And there was a lady uh, last weekend traveling. It was a big travel weekend, you know, and she was traveling on a plane somewhere here in the U.S. And she was reading her Bible on the plane like some people do, some Christians do that. And this guy next to her, he says, uh, you don't really believe all that junk in that book there that you're reading, do you? And she said, well, yeah, matter of fact, I, I really do. I believe it's the Word of God. I believe it's the Bible. I believe everything in there is right and true and happened, like I said, and all. And he says, ah, that can't be. He says, you know, like, for instance, there's a story in there about a guy that uh, got swallowed up by a whale. And he was alive three days in the belly of the whale. That can't happen. And uh, she said, well, I believe it happened. And he said, well, I don't think it did. She said, well, I'll tell you what. When I get to heaven, I'll ask him. His name's Jonah, and I'll just ask Jonah how that was, those three days in the belly of the whale. And he goes, well, what if he's not in heaven? And she said, well, then you can ask him. <laughs> All right? Try to get you one, D.A. All right, Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Matthew 3, 1 through 12. This is page 958 in the Black Bibles. By the way, I don't know if we still announce this, but we have a whole table full of Bibles back there. Feel free to grab one when you come in so you can follow along with us. It's helpful. Anybody there yet? Okay. Now in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then all of Jerusalem was going out to him, and all Judea and all the district around the Jordan. And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these very stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. The axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I. And I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear the threshing floor. And he will gather his wheat into the barn, and he will burn up all the chaff with unquenchable fire. Okay, there it is. Advent number two. God is coming. We're talking about His first coming. For to us a king is born. That's what Christmas is about. We're also talking about His second coming. Which we talked last week could happen at any moment. And even if it doesn't happen in the next moment, you could be killed in the next moment and you would have to meet your Maker. And so Advent is all about um, the joy of the first coming but also a word of preparation for the second coming. That we need to be ready at all times for the King to return. John the Baptist here kind of reminds us of a crazy street preacher on the street corner, right? Yelling out, repent, the end of the world's at hand. And you know, if you're not careful, you walk right by those kind of people or you walk across on the other side of the street, you know, kind of thing. Uh, John the Baptist would have been seen not really in that light then. He would have been seen as a politically dangerous figure to the state. He would be seen as a threat 
to the government for a couple reasons. One is, he is the second Elijah. Everybody can tell that. He dresses like Elijah. He comes from the wilderness like Elijah. He is the second Elijah. These were dangerous type people because revo- this, this country at this time is ripe for revolution. It is ripe for some charismatic leader to rise up and, and arm the peasants and overthrow the Roman government. This is a tinderbox man of, of, of danger stuff and it doesn't in our, covered in our text today, but John did, was murdered by the government as a threat to the government. Jesus in the same way. Um, There's just a lot there um, that we don't have time to go into, but but he comes from the wilderness. He comes out of the wilderness, and the wilderness is a place, everybody would have associated the wilderness as a place where our ancestors came across that desert. When we were delivered from bondage from Pharaoh, that's why, I, I don't know if you've ever wondered this, I did, is why, and I'm glad they do it, but the, at least one of the networks will always show, still, it's amazing, in a post-Christian culture, will still show the old movie, The Ten Commandments, at Easter time. And I used to always think, I really went, before I knew Jesus, I, I didn't care. But after I met Jesus, I was like, well, why, it was about Easter, why aren't we showing something about Jesus? Why do we keep showing this thing from the Old Testament and Moses delivering the people out of Egypt? Isn't somebody up in the network's a uh, little loco en la cabeza or something's wrong there because they're not getting it. But the thing of it is, is, is that that was the prototype of deliverance. You were in bondage and only God can deliver you from bondage. And so you had to come through the wilderness into the promised land. And so it's a prototype of what Jesus does for us in deliverance. We were slaves. And Jesus has come to set us free. So that's why they show that. But when, when a guy like John the Baptist shows up at this location at this time, everybody knows something's shaken big time. So he comes from the wilderness because that's where deliverance from God always comes. The, the wilderness is also a place of testing. Jesus was sent to the wilderness and tested and he won out there, you know. And it's a place where fresh things from God come come so so the very fact that john is in the wilderness preaching right there says a whole bunch before you even go down to hear what he's saying you already if you're a first century person you already know some stuff's going on so he is the second elijah he looks like elijah he acts like elijah let's go see what's going on so you go down there and what is the message that this guy's preaching he's preaching saying two things There's a separation coming, and there's a gathering in coming. That's basically his message. God is about to separate those that are not his, and then he's going to gather the ones that are his. And that's what he's saying. Now, this is the thing of it. This is not just the History Channel here, doing a documentary on a quasi-revolutionary figure in the Judean wilderness. This is actually a sermon that the guy preached. And, and it's actually a sermon that has been recorded in the, in the Gospels. And as such, it continues to be a sermon. It's not just a historical thing. It is actually an active sermon right now. And so it's been an active sermon for over 2,000 years. And guess what? Today, right here on December the 8th or whatever day it is in 2019, it becomes a sermon today that we have to hear. Because the great and terrible day of the Lord is upon us and we need to be ready. This is a get ready sermon. It's a message for the end times. And if John and his people in the first century thought they were in the end times, which they were, then we are ever so much more in the end times today. Maybe, huh? It's a message for America in 2019. At Advent of 2019 in America. That's what it's for. It's a message that must be preached until the great day when Jesus returns. This message, this sermon, does not go out of style. You know? Why? Because you and I will not be ready for God's second coming 
without getting this message down inside us, without getting the meat of this message. So it's a warning. It's a serious warning with a promise. It's a two-pronged message. There's a warning and there's a promise. So the first thing is the serious warning. So the serious warning goes out to two groups of people. It went out to two groups of people in the Judean area by the Jordan at the time when it was first preached. And today, it goes out to two groups of people. And so here we are. Um, the, the two groups are this. The regular people that just came out to see what this guy was saying. That's one group. And the second group is the religious people. Two groups of people. It's a serious warning to people. Let's take, them in, let's take the two groups right now. It's a serious warning for people who do not go to church here in America today. Just regular people in our culture. People we work with. People we go to school with. People we go to H-E-B. We see at H-E-B. People we see on the roads. <clears throat> The message is for them. Not just them. I'm going to get to you in a minute. But it's to them. And, uh, and what is the message? Repent. What does it mean? It means change your thinking. It means change the direction that you are going in life. It means turn around. You're going in the wrong direction. That's what it means. And it's not a message we hear much in America anymore, do we? Matter of fact, I was having a, a conversation with the lady yesterday, and she said, you know, I don't go to church anymore because I grew up in East Texas, and over there in East Texas, all I heard was, you're going to go to hell, you're going to go to hell, you're going to go to hell. <clears throat> now, I wanted to say to her, what's God saying? <laughs> But nobody in America wants to be associated with strong words these days. You know? Nobody wants to be confronted in America today by any word that doesn't feel good. Nobody in America wants to be told that maybe just possibly they're wrong. Completely wrong. But yet here it is. You're wrong. God's judgment is coming upon you. That, that's it. You will be judged and you are not ready for God's coming. That's it. Your lives are not in order. And you know, last week I told about that guy that owned that historical house in, in Great Britain and the tour group came and he wasn't ready and he, and he sent him out to the garden area and then he tidied the house up in 15 minutes so it was somewhat presentable. You can maybe tidy a house up in 15 minutes. You can't tidy a life up in 15 minutes. No, you're not ready. Your lives are not in order, and you will be separated. You will be cut off from everything that is good and pure, because that's what God is. Everything that's good and pure in this world right here comes from God. And if you don't stop what you're doing and turn around and wake up, you will be cut off from everything that's good and pure for eternity. You will perish without hope if you do not change. Your wickedness has a price and you have not paid for it yet, but you are about to. So, the regular people of the culture heard this message and they repented. They said, you're right, dude. They didn't bow up and say, hey, you can't talk like that. Who, who do you think you are talking to me like that? No, they heard the message and they repented. And they said, not only are we repenting, baptize us, brother. We need the power to live a new way. We, we do. We've been wrong. We change our mind. We're done with it. We want to go in a new direction. They were not like us post-Christians who sit in judgment on God and declare that He's wrong and I'm right. He's, he's wrong. He's unfair. He's unjust. How could He let this happen to me? Matter of fact, I'm so mad at Him, I just won't go to church for the rest of my life. They weren't like that. They heard the message and they changed. 
So it was a message for regular people. But it was also a message for church people. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were church people. They get a bad rap, really, in the Gospels most of the time, but think about it. Paul was one. Think about it. You're, you're a godly young man. You want to learn the ways of God. You're a young Jewish boy. What do you do? You sign up for Pharisee school. And you start doing that. They, 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 they get a bad rap because there was, there was a bad element where most of them did miss Jesus, but we have Joseph of Arimathea. We have Nicodemus. We have a lot of them that, that when they saw Jesus for what He was, they took it. They, they took the deal. So anyway... The church people came out to hear this street preacher. And, you know, we got to be careful. Because it's us. It's you and me. We're in the church today. We're church people. You know? And the message for us is still, repent. Look in your heart. And because there is the chance that uh, there's some of y'all that your lives are not pleasing to God. And see, these guys are saying, well, wait a minute now, look here, Bubba, I'm a descendant of Abraham, so I'm covered. How many in the evangelical church? Oh, well, wait a minute now, I've been baptized. I said the sinner's prayer. So I got my free ticket out of hell. Uh Uh-huh. And he said, no, you don't understand. God is capable of taking that rock right there and turning into a better Christian than you are right now. That's what he's saying. So, you know, and then First Peter says this. He says, no, God's judgment always begins in the house of God. Whew. Don't you wish I didn't preach the lectionary, you know? I was like... Man, I just wish we could just preach these pet peeve sermons that we like. But if we're going to preach the lectionary and we're going to go through the whole gospel, you've got to get to these kind of things. But I think it's good. It's healing for our bones. But what, does, but what does John say about it? He says, I'm looking for the fruit in your life. It says it's a fruit of repentance. In other words, we talked about it last week. There's a righteousness that is not mine that is an alien righteousness that comes from Christ that comes on me. But if I have really repented and that righteousness has really come on me, then my life will look different. My life will bear the fruits of repentance and not just be what what Dietrich Bonhoeffer would call cheap grace. My, my brother, when he's up at Texas Tech in the 80s, you know, everybody's partying, man. It's a big party scene. And he knew a guy that, that you know, was raised out there in <clears throat> Hale Center or someplace like that, good Baptist, Methodist place. And he said, oh, I'm covered by the blood, brother. Go out and party. And my brother said, man, you're not living right, man. You call yourself a Christian, you know, but look, look at the fruit of your life. He said, oh, I'm covered by the blood, brother. That's cheap grace. That's exactly what's being addressed right here. Mm-hmm. So, so what's the fruit? Okay, so, so here's the thing that helps us on this. It helped me a lot this week. Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament, helps us here. Because Malachi is written 400 years before this event, and many of the rabbis believed that God had not spoken in 400 years. Now, there was a lot that went on in those 400 years, and that's what the whole Apocrypha is about in the Catholic Bible, and it's, some, it's called deuterocanonical uh, literature. So, what us Protestants would say is it's not the Word of God, but it's pretty interesting stuff. That there's some good historical stuff, especially the Maccabees and some historical data that happened between those 400 years. But we don't need to go there today. But what I want to say is, is that John the Baptist shows up as the last of the great Old Testament prophets. Really. The one right before him would have been Malachi. And so in Malachi 4, and it just so happens, it's very easy to get there from where you are. Just go left. To the la- if you have a Protestant Bible, it's the next chapter to the left, Malachi, or as some people call him, Malachi, the last of the Italian prophets. <laughs> right, Patricia? One of our worship team 
leaders over here is from Italy. Full, full, full blown Italian over there. She's a blessing to us. Okay, so Malachi 4. And so then in Malachi 4, verses 5, he says this Behold, I'm going to send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord. All right, so that right there tells us that we're right on the money when we believe that John is the, is the second Elijah. And then move up to, to 4 1. See, a day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and wicked will be stubble. The day that comes will burn them up, says the Lord, and leave neither root nor branch. So Malachi tells us that there's two kind of sins that, that it seems like God is after, wickedness and arrogance. So let's just talk about this. So this is wickedness, and now we're still dealing with the two groups of people. We're dealing with the people at H-E-B, and we're dealing with you and me, right? So wickedness among church people and regular people. The Bible tells us that wickedness will not inherit the kingdom of God. The Bible, so what does the Bible call wickedness? Well, a lot of what you and me might even view as entertainment on Netflix or something like that is called wickedness in the Bible. I mean, I, I went to the movies one time and I, and, uh, I was sitting in there and I thought, uh, that's, that's one of the Ten Commandments they broke. I see now, what's the next one? And I paid God's money for this movie, right? And then there's the second commandment they broke and the third and fourth. That doggone movie broke all ten of the commandments. <laughs> and I'm sitting there using God's money to pay for this stuff. Something's wrong. So the other thing about wickedness is, is that we have this tendency to say, well, I'm not as bad as that guy. But if, so that's why it's good that we have a standard that we can compare to. So here's just what wickedness is called in the Bible. Getting drunk is wicked. Flirting with a chick at, at work when you're married to some other person, that's wicked. Uh, having an affair uh, is wicked. Uh, murder is wicked. Lying, something, mm, lying is wicked. Adultery is wicked. You're single. You're single. Sex outside of, of heterosexual marriage is wicked. That's it. I know. I'm stepping on it. Pornography is watching two other people have sex. That's wicked. It's abomination to the Lord. Uh, partying down at Nephew's uh, is wicked. Carousing is wicked. Stealing is wicked. The Ten Commandments, they're helpful there. So what else does the Bible call wicked? Um, has to do with uh, money, sex, and influence, really. If your money, if your sex, and if your influence is handled in anything other than a godly manner, it's wicked, according to the Bible. So, money spent in the wrong direction will be considered wicked. Not being generous. Why aren't many of us generous? Because we're in debt. We can't be generous. We might want to be generous. We might want to contribute to the kingdom, but we're in debt. The average credit card debt in America is $35,000. Right, Bob? That's Dave Ramsey's statistics. That means the guy you live next door to owes $35,000 to Visa. Do you know at 18 or 19 percent interest how, how long it's going to take that guy to get out of debt to Visa? It ain't going to happen. Right? So, um, we would like to give to people in need. We would like to give because God saved us and we're, we're trying to become generous. We're starting to learn how to tithe. We're all that kind of stuff. But that's why it's so important that we deal with these other broken areas in our lives because they are stopping us from being who we want to be. That's a whole other talk. But Malachi, if you want to just keep pressing a little bit, in chapter 3, he says not tithing is wickedness. Yeah. Oh, Lord, when's John going to quit? He's still pressing. You know, so like if I use my influence in a wrong manner, 
It's wicked because God gave me the influence. He gave me my job. So you're a supervisor or you're something at work. God gave you that. I mean, yeah, you worked hard and yeah, you have education. Yeah, you have your skill set and all that stuff. But God gave you that. And if you use that in a wrong direction, it's wickedness. You know? Um, If you use it to build you up. We have people in Jesus' church do all that. All the time people do that. I want to be somebody important. I, I kind of have low self-esteem, so maybe if I could just be the pastor of the church or if I could be a head of the ministry team or if I could get up on the stage and, and, and be a performer, maybe I would get kind of, you know, who's getting the glory? It all has to be about God getting glory, not me getting glory, right? It, it's really, it's tricky, man, but that's money, sex, and influence. All right, so that's wickedness. Oh, thank you. Move on. Please move on, John. The second one is arrogance. So Malachi calls wickedness and arrogance. So what is arrogance? Well, arrogance is, it's, it's sin, but it's kind of hidden sin. You know, because if I'm arrogant, you know, I can hide it pretty good a little bit sometimes. But what is it? It's more a sin of the heart. It's, it's pride, maybe. Maybe it's unforgiveness. Maybe it's divisiveness. Maybe it's tribalism here in America. I'm a Democrat by God and I'll die a Democrat. Or I'm a Republican by golly and how could those Democrats even, even none of them are going to heaven. Every one of them is going to hell and there's a tribalism there and you hold your, your Republicanism or your Democratism higher than you owe your allegiance to Jesus the King. Oh, that's arrogance, brother. Arrogance, you know. These one-issue voters. That's arrogance, man. Say, I, I'm a Second Amendment person. I, I am a Second Amendment person, but I know a lot of them. I'm a Second Amendment person. I'm a, I'm a one-issue voter. That is arrogance, man. You can't be a Christian and be like that. That's arrogance. Entitlement is an arrogance. I'm entitled, I, I, but you know, I, I've got these issues in my past and you owe me and all that. That's arrogance, man. I have a right to hate you. I have a right to be offended by you. I have a right to sit in judgment on you because you're not my culture or you don't vote like me or you ain't got the same skin color as me. I tell you what, I saw, I saw a sermon David Wilkerson preach at, at Times Square Church. That church is about, it has a hundred nationalities in it. And he's a white guy, and I mean, he said some stuff, and he's like, you do not have a right to be offended at this church. And it was, t- I was like, wow, dude. How can you talk like that? Because you're full of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You're like John the Baptist. And you say, look, God told me to say this stuff, I'm saying this stuff. And I'm saying it with fire and anointing of the Holy Spirit. You know, and so then what other stuff is arrogance? Idols in our lives? What is an idol? Uh, Usually it's a good thing. It started off as a good thing. Probably started off as God's gift to you. But somewhere it switched. And it quit being God's gift, and you started owning it. And it started defining who you are. Maybe it's your role at work. Maybe it's your, your status or something like that. But the point of it is, is it defines you and there's no way you're going to give it up if Jesus said give it up. But the funny thing is, the closer you get to God, the more you hear Him do stuff like that. Like I was reading Watchman Nee about this. Uh, he was talking about the Holy Spirit and, and he was wondering why he didn't have more power in the Holy Spirit. And he was in love with this little girl uh, named Charity, but she wasn't really where he was with the Lord. Can anybody relate to that statement right there? And God, and he said, but she was everything he ever wanted. And God said, you know why I'm not baptizing you in the Holy Spirit? Because you need to give charity up. The guy's like 22 years old at the time. Watch me knee. And he says, the hardest thing I ever did. He said, but I said, I love you more, Lord. I give her up. And I walk away. And he did. Um, now, you know, I almost hate to say the second part of it because it's like. But then God gave charity back to him about five or six years later. 
and she had become filled with God, and she was then fit for him. Some of y'all are single because the, the guy you're supposed to marry, he, he, he ain't got it all in the game yet. God's still cooking him. You know, and the other way around too. But anyway, the whole point of it is, is that there becomes times in our lives where God says, you need to give that up. And that's, that's a tough thing. So, it could be a job, it could be a lifestyle. Um, but the thing of it is, is that this stops the flow of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to tell you something. If you're going to live in the kingdom, and you're going to live close to God, you better get used to this kind of stuff. It happens all the time. One time it happened to me, there was this guy, he wanted to come and, and uh, do a ministry thing uh, at our church here. And, uh, and, he, and he mentioned a guy that I know doesn't like me. And I thought to myself, oh, if this guy comes, then this other guy that doesn't like me might come, and then I might have to see him. And God said, that's why I sent this guy to you, because you have unforgiveness in your heart about this other guy. And I was like, wow. And so I thought about it for a minute, and I thought, wait a minute. And, and then I just, because, oh, and this was a gift from the Holy Spirit, I was just like, wow. God has given me all this stuff and forgiven me all this stuff. Why can't I forgive that guy? So I said, I'll forgive him. It was that easy. I said, I'll forgive him. And I did. And I invited this guy. And he came and did some preaching and stuff. And it was incredible for the church. And that's scary to me as a pastor that I could have idols in my life or something, arrogant sin in my life that actually could prevent you guys from uh, experiencing the flow of the Lord because of my junk, right? That's a, it's a scary deal, man. And I, boy, and you know, guess what? On the great and terrible day of the Lord, I got to give account for that stuff. I mean, it's going to be like a big movie screen, and it's going to be like, let's look at all of John's crud. You know? Uh huh, all of us. Anyway, John's message um, is basically saying you need to be ready to stand on that great day. So, part of it can be a resistance to the Holy Spirit. You know, there's people out there on the internet selling books and preaching sermons against the Holy Spirit. And uh, that's a scary deal, man, because that's what some of the Pharisees did. They said, hey, that power Jesus is using, that's the power of Beelzebub. And, and Jesus said, that's one sin that's not going to be forgiven right there. And so it's a really scary thing to be standing in resistance to the Holy Spirit of God. But we, we can do that. And I've done that. And, um, you know, the thing of it is, is we've got to have the Holy Spirit to do what God's told us to do in the world today. We can't get it done. But see, all of us have a way to do this. We all want to put God in a category. Kind of box Him up. Like this thing's a box. Let's just put God in this box and let's put my marriage in this box and my job in this box and God I love you and I'll, I'll do this but don't you get out of this box on me because I can control this box I understand this box and I've lived like that before and I was a youth pastor and we were doing youth camps and we'd bring in these really Holy Spirit filled preacher guys and I mean they were on fire for God and, and it's amazing what happens when the Holy Spirit shows up in a meeting and I mean kids that were hard and wearing black and depressed and going to kill themselves and stuff like that. When the Holy Spirit would hit them, they'd come running forward. And they'd get delivered. But a lot of times when these guys would pray for them, they'd touch them on their head and they'd get slain in the Spirit, you know. And I'm the leader of the meeting, you know. And, and this is going on, you know. And I believe in it. I theologically got no problem with it. But I, I had no use for it in my own life. And so I was like, ah, okay, good, okay, look, pick them up, let's get them off, we got to load this stuff up, get it on the trailer, you know, it's all this kind of junk. And I realized what I was doing is, I'm putting God in a box. Now, thank you for saving me, Jesus, thank you for all that, but guess what, you can't break out like that in a youth group, because it makes me nervous. No, but look at the fruit, this is, what, this is what John's saying, what's the fruit of it? And the fruit of it is kids are set free and all this kind of stuff. But the leader is all bound up. Oh, God, dog, what's going to happen? Oh, man. 
What are the parents going to say when their kid comes home speaking in tongues? We've had that here. Hey, I hope it wasn't you, but I'm going to tell you something. Your kid goes to youth camp, and they're in 8th grade or ninth grade, and they get filled with the Holy Spirit, and they begin to speak in tongues, and they come home, and, and you have put God in a box, Mr. Mr. Daddy of the family, and your kid threatens you by their fire from God. What it, well, I've seen it happen. You know what the first thing they do? They get a wet blanket and throw it on that fire. I've seen it. Man, don't be that guy. Ooh, don't be that guy. But by God's grace, he got me out of it, man. He got me out of it. I went to some meetings in Pensacola, and I saw the Holy Spirit touching people. There were some things I didn't understand. I saw people kind of shaking and stuff. Let me tell you something. God, you know, like, oh, we got three-phase electric coming into this building right here. So we got a 440 line out there. Well, when you stick this socket over here is, is a 110. It has to get transformed down. 440 to 220 to 120, then we can use it. We can plug in the coffee pot. If you plug in the coffee pot to the 440, it'll blow you and a coffee pot to kingdom come. We're dealing with the power of the universe here. Don't you think that when His Spirit comes on, your mortal, uh, Paul said, uh, we hold this thing in, a, in an earthen vessel, when the power of the universe touches your body, sometimes you just can't handle it. Amen. Circuits blown. <laughs> but I came to a place where I said, you know, there's a lot of charlatans out there. There's a bunch. I mean, they make movies, uh, uh, gentry uh, something, some movie in the 40s about. Anyway, people make fun of these tent revival people. They make fun of that stuff. And, and there's a bunch of shysters out there. I think that's actually a cuss word in German, to be quite honest with you. I wish Walter Heidenreich was here, the word shyster. I believe it's a bad word. Uh, I didn't mean to say it. It's just because I, I could come out with some, but I, I just choose not to. But anyway, <clears throat> there's a lot of shenanigans going on. There's a lot of fake stuff going on. But what I came to the conclusion was is, wait a minute. I can preach my brains out to these depressed teenagers wearing black and I can't see a change in them. And I see get a guy from Louisiana come over here full of the Holy Spirit and he talks 10 minutes and then touches them and God changes them. There's a dead monkey on the line somewhere. There's something wrong with me. And I finally had to realize is that I've got to say that, okay, yes, there's shenanigans that go on. Yes, it would be easier to believe that God never heals anybody, never changes anybody, never delivers anybody from demons, and all we got here is just these sermons. Are you going to just preach a sermon? And it, that would be easier for me as a pastor. But I have to get square with the fact that the book of Acts and what happens in the New Testament is absolutely saturated with the power of the Holy Spirit. And I don't have to understand everything. All the New Testament tells me to do is discern the Spirit's and test the spirits, and I do that to the best of my ability, but there is too much at stake for me to go, nah, you keep that Holy Spirit junk over, over there, and you do that, and we'll do this. No, sir. Not while I'm alive. Not with me. I cannot honestly deal with God in that manner anymore. Amen. And you know what? When I got free of that junk in the mid-90s, God set me free. He set me free. And I still don't like to have meetings with people who get mad at me and tell me about why the Holy Spirit doesn't do this today and that today and the next thing today. And I try to be calm and tell them all this, but the thing of it is, I got a testimony. And an argument always loses to a guy with an experience. And I don't want to have one experience. I got bunches of experiences. And uh, so that's kind of my story with the whole arrogant sin thing. Okay, I got to move on because um, you all already know too much about me. I want to get to the promise. So John is saying, repent. All this stuff you're holding on to is holding you back. Repent. But he's, so it's a warning. But he's saying there's a promise. The promise is that if you will turn in repentance, God will meet you. And we've seen this in Malachi 4, chapter 2. I mean, chapter 4, verse 2. 
But for you who fear my name, revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings and you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. How many, I don't think there's too many. Well, there's some country people in here. And you know what I'm talking about. You've seen it. You see it in sheep. You see it in deer. But I'm also dealing with some urbanites who don't know uh, anything about cattle. So for, for y'all's for y'all's benefit, I got a short, I got a 14 second video of a real happy little calf. And then it's going to roll right into some guy in Ireland who's letting his cows out. They've been pinned up all winter, I guess. It's real cold up there. And I, it's, it's, the whole thing's like two minutes, but I just want you to see what, what the guy's talking about. So roll with that if we could. Well, it's a beautiful spring day in April, so um, we're going to start letting our animals out now. Yeah, yeah. First lot to go out are the young stock. So these have been in all winter and they're not used to actually going on grass some of these so it'll be a bit of a shock for them. Let's see how they all react. Oh that was off like a rocket. Look at this, brilliant isn't it? Look at the excitement here. Oh girls and boys. Right, they're, they're not hanging around, look at that. They're little racehorses. Now we're letting these out today, and I think we're gonna let the cows out tomorrow. And if you look up there, you can just see the cows looking over the, uh, over the fence. They're obviously upset not to be let out. So we're going to let the cows out tomorrow. These little ones, we just let them out just now, a day early. That's the difference. That's the difference. Yeah. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, you act like the happy cows. While you're, yeah, while you're still pinned up, you're pinned up. And that's the promise. Don't bow up and go, don't tell me to repent, man, so I can just stay in my pen, stay in this place with all these other stinky cows, and we just stink together till we drop dead. Is that what you want? When the Baptist is telling you, repent, and you'll be like the happy bovines. That's the whole thing. So, here's the promise. Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. John says, I just come to baptize in water, but the one coming after me will baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. So this is an inward thing. This is an inside you thing. This is a love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control thing. How many of us couldn't use some more of that? I needed some of it this morning when Susan made me mad. <laughs> the Holy Spirit will teach you from the inside. Does He use outside? Yeah, outside's happening right now. I'm preaching the Word of God. But it is of no use unless the Holy Spirit is on the inside saying, listen to it. Right? He'll teach you from the inside. From the inside, He'll show you which way to go, what to choose. You will be guided. Now, He uses the whole community of faith. You're in financial trouble. You got convicted because I talked about credit card debt. Good. You go meet with us. We'll hook you up with Bob Davis. He'll talk to you. We'll get a plan going on. But the Holy Spirit will be speaking to you from the inside while outside counselors are also helping. Is that okay? Have you ever thought about loving God? How alien that is? I have. How could I love God? How could I stand here on Sunday morning and actually really love Jesus? I do. I raise my hands. I say, I love you, God. I never used to be like that. Where did that come from? It came from the Holy Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit is the third person in Trinity. The Holy Spirit loves the Father. He loves the Son. And when He's in my life, I love the Father and the Son and the Spirit. It's an amazing thing. Right? And so then, not only that, but then I have this love for things that are holy and godly. And you know what? I don't want to watch the stuff that breaks the Ten Commandments no more. Now, it's always a battle. I'll be honest with you. It's always a battle. There's always going to be a temptation there. But in the end, turn that trash off. I don't want that crap in my house, man. Come on. Jeremiah said you'll be given a new heart. But the Holy Spirit is also an outward thing. Sometimes we just stop at the inward. I, I got mine. I got mine. I got my happy place. So to heck with you, to hell with you. I'm not going to even help you get to the happy place because I got mine. And that happens to us too. And that's a sin. I don't care about anybody else. I just care about me getting my happy place and, and having the Holy Spirit for me and my little family and my little church or whatever. And I don't care about you, the, the other people. But you know, the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit cares about the other people. He sent John the Baptist to preach to the regular people and the church people. So that's an interesting thing there. So it's an outward thing too. And what does that do? The Holy Spirit has gifts of power for outward ministry. Outward ministry. Spiritual gifts for helping others. Gifts of prophecy and, and, and knowledge and wisdom and healing. And, and we can't be afraid about these things. If somebody says, you, you know, then you should say, you should, you should have the attitude of, Hey, Lord, I want more of that. Show me about that. Teach me about that stuff. Not, not like this. Uh, 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 yeah, nah, nah. So in the Bible, in 1 Corinthians 12, we see the gifts of the Spirit. And they list all these gifts of the Spirit. When you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, you have access to every one of those. Now, you may not use every one of those in a certain situation. Here's a, here's a for instance. There are some people with more resident gifts of the Spirit. Like there are some people that have the gift of healing and I maybe don't but that doesn't mean as a spirit filled person that I'm not supposed to pray for somebody to get well because a lot of times they do but if you were to graph this thing like there was a guy with the gift of healing and most of them are on our prayer team so please come for a prayer team but if you were to graph say me and Jerry Nicholson let's just say me and Jerry pray for 100 people and, and 62 of them get healed that Jerry prayed for and only 35 of them get healed that I prayed for well, that's still, what, 97-something people that got healed between the two of us. But he has more of a resident gift of healing than I do. And that's okay with me, man. And the same thing with prophecy. Like, Doug has helped me a lot. Doug came into my life. He said, I'm a prophet. Well, I always, and he knows this, we all, you know, it's like, wait a minute. What? But I don't do weird, brother. But the thing of it is, I do do weird. I do, I do weird. Um, but, um. But I have a gift of prophecy too. It comes out differently. Uh, I think really more what Doug actually has, if you don't mind me saying, is more of a, a gift of knowledge sometimes of future things that are going to happen. He's helped us out here a lot in the church with that. But I have a gift of prophecy. So I'm up here preaching, but a lot of times I'm prophesying, okay? But that doesn't mean that maybe Courtney has a gift of healing or administration or helps or something like that, but that doesn't mean she can't prophesy at any given point if she's full of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean that God can't give her a word of knowledge. And a lot of times that happens in an environment where we want the Holy Spirit to operate. We're worshiping Jesus and all this stuff. God might give Courtney a, a, a word about Jerry. Hey, Jerry, you know, while I was praying, I just saw you there. And God just says, what you've been praying for, uh, it, it's already done, brother. I don't know. That's how this stuff works. And actually, the truth of the matter is, once you get that arrogant sin out of your heart, it's fun. It's a good way to live. Are you going to miss it sometime? Maybe. But you know what? You're loved. You're, if you're in an environment of grace and you've got a good heart, man, you know what? If you, if you come encourage me on something that never happens, what's the worst that happened? You missed it. I got encouraged. Big deal. Big deal. I think we err on caution a little bit too much. Anyway, neither here nor there. So there's that. Now, this week, so I'm working on this sermon, right? And I'm thinking, oh, Lord. How am I going to preach repent on Sunday to a bunch of Americans who, that's anathema. And then I meet old James Dudley. You know him, Saved by Grace Church out at Canyon Lake. Y'all used to do some motorcycle stuff with this guy. 70 years old. Meet him over at Perk Up. 
trying to talk to him about corridor prayer. We're talking. He says that, that he used to be scared to death of the Holy Spirit. And he said, then he went down to Mexico on an evangelistic thing. And he met a Mexican pastor who just the day before had laid hands on a dead guy and raised him from the dead. And he says, so I'm preaching in this guy's church through an interpreter. And this guy don't know I'm scared spitless about uh, all this stuff. And he says, so I'm preaching, I'm preaching, and they interpret, they interpret. And then he says, I hear them say, and tonight, Pastor James is going to pray for you for signs and wonders to happen in your life. And he said, I was looking for the door. How could I get away? Because no sign and wonder had ever happened in my life. He said, I wasn't the guy. They had billed the wrong guy, I thought. He said, and I was scared to death. And he said, but I preached my sermon that night through the interpreter. And I said, come forward. Anybody who wants God. He said, nobody moved. He said, oh boy, I knew it. They had the wrong guy for sure. He said, I waited, I waited. And he said, I just walked over to the edge and I'm just waiting and it's silent. And oh boy, here's the, <laughs> this is the, this is the, the real this is it, right? This is the marquee sign. We brought him in from America. Here's Mr. Power God. And he said, what happened was, is those guys in that culture, they wait on their pastor. And if their pastor gives them the nod, then they can go up for prayer. So there was three churches represented, and all three pastors gave the nod, and he said, all they started coming. And then he goes, then I was really scared. Because then, like, they've already told them that all this stuff's going to happen. And, and he, said, he said, so I just prayed for the first lady he goes man I pray for that lady and the power of the Holy Spirit just hit her and she just just um, was slain in the spirit really was just overcome by the power of the Holy Spirit and then one after another after another after another after another I thought that was so encouraging to me you know so then so that's the Holy Spirit and then John says that Jesus is going to baptize you with fire what does fire mean well fire and the Holy Spirit go together but they come to burn evil away from our lives. A refining fire. And, uh, and a fire will also temper you. It'll take, it'll take mild steel if you do it right and turn it into hardened steel. Um, it will make you strong for mission. It'll make you, the fire will burn up all the bugs in your wood. Could I say it like that? It'll purify your life. Man, we need the fire of God to come on us. And to burn away this worthless stuff. And we need a new baptism of the Holy Spirit in our lives, you know? And, and it's not a one-time deal like, oh yeah, 1973, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. No, no, it's not like that. Yeah, maybe for the first time you came up for the Holy Spirit to touch you with this power, but I have found that I have to be at a place where I'm always accessing the power of the Holy Spirit. And when I'm not, i got to find out why. Because it's not a problem with God, it's a problem with me. So what went cold in me, right? But... We need the Holy Spirit to take us to a new level with God, to worship Him more, to study His Word more, to be more like Him, to love to pray, to, to love to see people get saved, to love to see people come to the Lord and get all rid of this self-centeredness that keeps coming on us. We need the Holy Spirit, you know. So, I'm probably running out of time. i, I got to read. You know, this is Charles Finney's life. Power from on high is the name of the book. Actually, I got this from one of those Louisiana youth evangelists back in the 90s who came and talked to my youth group. And uh, there's, this is great stories from America here um, on the Second Great Awakening. Could I just read you one? Charles Finney. Um, this guy, so Charles Finney, he lives in, he, he's born about 1801, 1802. He lives to about 1880, something like that. He's probably the most famous guy of the Second Great Awakening here in America. He says, uh, to the honor of God alone, I'll say a little bit about my own experience on the matter. He said, I was power powerfully converted on the morning of the 10th of October, and in the evening of that same day, and in the morning of the following day, I received overwhelming baptisms of the Holy Ghost, which went through me as it seemed to my body and my soul, I immediately found myself clothed with such power from on high that a few words dropped here and there to individuals were their means of their immediate conversion. My words seemed to fasten like barbed arrows upon the souls of men. They cut like a sword. 
they broke the heart like a hammer. Multitudes can attest to this. Oftentimes, a word dropped without any remembrance on my part would fasten conviction and often result in almost immediate conversion. Sometimes I would find myself, this is interesting, in a great measure empty of this power. And I would go out and visit people and find that I made no saving impression upon them. And I would exhort and pray, with, but no results would happen. This is it. I would then set apart a day for private fasting and prayer, fearing that the power had departed from me. And I would inquire anxiously after the reason of this apparent emptiness in my life. Here's the key word. After humbling myself and crying out for help, the power would return upon me with all its fullness. And this has been my experience of my whole life. And then he has all these stories. Like, for instance, he's, uh, I'll give you one. He's, uh, he's visiting this town. Oh, this is just so amazing. So he's visiting this town, this village, and he's there for about a week. This is in the 1800s. And he's staying at the hotel, and he notices, he says, the profanity of the people in the town. Everybody's just mean and cussing and everything. And he finds out there's no religious meetings at all ever in the town. But they do have a meeting house. So he asks, can we get in the meeting house? And he doesn't even know the name of the town because he was invited there to preach there. He doesn't even know who these people are. And he says, I, he says so I almost didn't make it. I had to walk to... He's at, he's at this one village in a hotel. He has to walk to this other little village. I, I kind of confuse you. And he says, I got so faint along the way that I almost passed out. Now, this is, this is it. The devil doesn't want him to go talk to that town. So he goes to the town, and he finds the guy that invited him to the town, and he says, I couldn't even have time to prepare a sermon. And he says, so the people tried to sing when they got together in the meeting, and he said, the singing was so horrible, I had to cover my ears. <laughs> and, he said, I, I, and he said, but while I was covering my ears, my God, God gave me the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. So he says, I get up, and he said, I preach to him about Sodom and Gomorrah. I said, unless you repent, you'll end up like Sodom and Gomorrah and all this stuff. And he said, they looked at me like they were going to beat me up. And he goes, I didn't know why. And he said, so I thrust the, <laughs> I love the way he talked. He said, I thrust at him with the sword of the spirit with all I could do. Finally, the Holy Spirit hit him. They all started crying. They fell on the floor. They just started wailing and crying out to God. It lasted for a day and a half. And he found out that the name of the town was actually called Sodom. And that the guy that had invited him was a guy named Lot. It's amazing. Power from on high. You could get it at Amazon or something like that. One more thing. There are some of us that are so burdened down, so trapped, like the cattle in that barn, that you can't move. You're, you're, you're heavy. You're full of oppression. Well, I don't tell you, that's not the way God wants you to live. And uh, you got to call on the name of the Lord. I mean, you got to call on the name of the Lord because only God can fix you. It's a mess. Only God can do it. And, and complaining is much easier than praising. You got to stop that. Grumbling and complaining is natural. But if you want power from on high, you got to shout praises to God. And you got to start praising God when you don't feel like it. And you got to say, God, you're going to deliver me. You got to start declaring the promises that God has given over your life. And as a matter of fact, today I'm, re, I'm, re, uh, I'm reminding you of those things. It's time to stand up and call on the name of the Lord. And you know what? If that doesn't work, do what Finney did. Take a day and fast. You start fasting one day a week. Matter of fact, we're going to talk more about that in January. You start fasting one day a week, you will see the power of God start coming on your life. It'll be amazing. Give God no relief until there is a breakthrough. So basically, that's the end of it. We have to repent. And I hope that everybody in this room has something to repent of today. I've laid it out as best I could. And really, you're not supposed to come to this table until you've repented. And that's one reason why I love doing communion every week. The danger is it becomes a ritual. Oh, time to go eat the little bread and drink the little juice. No, it needs to be the time where we repent of our wickedness and our arrogance. And ain't nobody above it in here. And actually, the closer you get to God, the more you'll get in touch with some stuff.
And you wonder to yourself, is it a never-ending thing? Sometimes I feel that way. But I tell you this, you're loved. You're loved. And God tells you that because He wants to give you the power. And there, there's some besetting sins where you say, man, every time a guy preaches like this, which ain't often enough, but I feel guilty. I feel like, oh, I'm worthless. No, that's the wrong feeling. That's not the kind of thing that brought him to the water to get baptized and get him set free like those happy bovines. No, the word of the Lord is, I have power that you don't know about. Well, right. oh, yeah, but I have never experienced it. So? <laughs> what does that mean? That don't mean a hill of beans to us. It's just because you haven't experienced something from God that God has for you, he's going to give it to you. And if you call out to God, he will give it to you. He will deliver you. That's all there is to it. And so I think there's two things we have to do today. We have to repent. We have to say, where, where, are we, uh, wh where are we blocking the Lord? Where are we not ready for his return? And the second thing we have to say is, we need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. We need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I'm, I'm talking about dunked in the cup, Bubba. In the Holy Spirit. And wait a minute. Now what am I going to look like if that happens? You're going to look like Jesus. You know? And all that stuff. And I think this is a sermon that we should preach every week. Because I think in our Christian life, in this planet, this thing has to happen every week. I, every week I need a new baptism in the Holy Spirit. And every week I probably need to repent of some stuff. Now let's stand up if we could. All right, so let me just call on the name of the Lord here for us. And by the way, our prayer teams are going to be here at the end, and they want to pray for you to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I think uh, Monday night prayer, we're going to start talking about the Holy Spirit a little bit more because I'm noticing that there's an ignorance of the Holy Spirit out there. And uh, not that I have all the answers, but when I start teaching stuff, I learn a lot of new stuff myself. Hallelujah. So at the end of the meeting, we're going to have people to pray for baptism in the Holy Spirit for you, all right? But right now, we want to pray about the repentance thing. So let's just close our eyes real quick, and let's just say this. Lord, I tell you what, I can start this thing by saying that, that I, always some, I, I have this proclivity to try to put you in a box and to try to make life comfortable for me, and really, I'm not on game with you when I'm acting like that. And so I pray for the people here in the church house today. You're working in every one of their lives or they wouldn't be in the room today. And, 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 and if there's anything that is out of line in any of our lives, I don't care what it is. Any, it might have been a good gift, but it has become an idol. It has, it has taken the wrong place in our lives. I ask that you show us that right now. And we don't look at that in hopelessness and go, oh, I could never change. No. God showed it to you so you can cry out to God and say, this is wickedness in my life. This is arrogance in my life. This is secret sin in my life. I've been shucking and jiving and fooling everybody, but I can't fool God. And today is the last day of that because I'm not ready for him to show back up. And so right now, God, would you just reveal to us the stuff that's blocking us, the stuff that's keeping us locked up like those cows in the barn and keeping us from where we need to be and what we need to be doing? And we believe that the promise of, of Holy Spirit in fire is for us. It's a part of the sermon. It's a part of John's sermon. And that means it's for us today. And we need it, Lord. We need it to do what we need to do. There is millions of people in this central Texas place that do not have Jesus. And they're not ready. If you were to come back tomorrow night, 26 million people live in Texas right now. I don't know how many of them are going to heaven, but it ain't, very, it ain't enough. How about that? Use us, Lord. Amen. 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 We're going we're gonna to share communion now. And um, I want to read this from 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight. 28. It says, Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. And when we think about examining ourselves... Um, I'd like for us, just for a second, if you would, raise your hands like this in an open format to God, kind of an open, open setting to God. Um, and let's just take just a, a few seconds to examine the last 24 hours in areas of, of wickedness and areas of arrogance in our lives. Just the last 24 hours, let's sit and with your hands open, 
let's think about those those things and, and in any area of your life where you have stumbled or failed or been arrogant or wicked. open to flip your hands down in a form of saying, God, I give away those things. Take your palms and put them down and, and drop the things that we've been so um, failing and, and, and um, sinful and, and all the things we drop them. And we, we let them go, Father God. We let all the things go, Lord, that have made us stumble and we want to get rid of them, Lord. We repent of them, God. That's examining ourselves and, and not just thinking about it, but we, we, we let go. And, and also next, I want you to lift your hands up again and receive God's forgiveness. And we, we receive your forgiveness now, right now, Jesus. We have let go those things and we have, we have put them away and we've declared they're wrong and they're bad and we don't want to do them anymore. And we receive your forgiveness, Jesus. We thank you that you uh, gave your life for us, that we can give up the things that we hold on to and we can receive the forgiveness and the love that you want us to have. Thank you. Amen. And I want to read this. This has always been a, a growing up a, a, a prayer of repentance that I've always said growing up and I think we can all say it together um, before we receive the communion. Put it up on the screen. Let's say this together. Father God, I am sorry for my sins with all my heart in choosing to do wrong and failing to do good I have sinned against you whom I should love above all things our Savior Jesus Christ suffered and died for us and I firmly intend with your help to sin no more and to avoid whatever leads me to sin I thank you, Jesus, for your forgiveness, and I receive it now. Amen. So what we're going to do now is you're going to be dismissed row by row by the ushers, and they're going to, you're going to come on up in a line and pick up the bread and the juice, and then go back to your seat, and then we're going to come back up here and pray over the elements and take them together. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay, we've got Rob and Cheryl Bissett that are going to be praying over the elements for us today. God, we just praise your most holy, holy name. You're so mighty, so worthy, such a good God. Just pray, Lord, for just all these things we've learned today, and something that stands out to me is come across someone and joy that we have through, through that. We're, just praise your holy, holy name. Thank you, Jesus. Let's take the bread. Lord, it's our desire to be filled with your Holy Spirit and to bear fruit that is acceptable to you. Yet we recognize, Lord, that uh, we can only be made right and we can only do that through the blood of Jesus. And we thank you for his sacrifice, his willingness to take the cup 
and we remember him and that act this morning as we share in that. Lord, just help us to, uh, to go out from here living in that forgiveness and in his resurrection and to bear that fruit. Thank you, Jesus. Take the cup. You know, it just struck me that it could probably is true. A group this big. There's people here, you this sounded real good to you, but you don't know how to get there because you've never asked Christ to come into your life. And so you need to do that. You don't get in this stuff I'm talking about today, you don't get none of it unless you get Jesus in your life. And so if you're not sure, like if you were to die tonight, this afternoon, get run over by a TDS garbage truck or something, put in a plug for them. Um, if you're not sure you're going to heaven, then you need to come to our prayer team today and say, hey, I'm not sure I'm straightened out here with God. All right? So prayer teams, come on up here. Let's get y'all up here, get y'all visible. And I'm going to bless everybody. So I'm going to bless you. You want to receive a blessing this week? Do it. I bless you with the Holy Spirit and fire. In the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit and fire to fall on everybody in this room. I don't know how it's going to look for you today, this week, but God is close. The kingdom of heaven is dear. And it's here for you this week. Amen. It's going to be a great week. Come up and get some prayer. God bless you.